Dr. Joanne Paul, thanks for joining us on Viral History. Now, your most recent work centres upon that most fascinating of historical figures, Sir Thomas More. Um, he's a man that's been interpreted in so many different ways over the years in productions like A Man for All Seasons and most recently Wolf Hall. What do you think is the most accurate version? Well, both are very highly fictionalised accounts. Uh, a Man for All Seasons is the saintly scholar. That goes back to uh, Moore's family after his death. They were attempting to, to sell him um, as, as a saint, attempting to get the Pope to canonize him as a saint. doesn't happen until 1935, but they're trying. And so they're producing biographies that put him in the best possible light. Of course, in Hilary Mantel, Wolf Hall, she's also pulling on 16th century histories, particularly Fox's Book of Martyrs, where he's portrayed as a zealous Protestant um, hunter. Um, and certainly an obstinate sort of figure, and then she's picking up on that. So both of them actually come from 16th century accounts of Moore's life. There's these sort of propaganda machines that spin into action um, as soon as, as he dies. So neither are really accurate to his own life, but both are accurate to the, the 16th century. Funnily enough, perhaps, and I might get into trouble for saying this, perhaps the most measured, nuanced uh, portrayal of Thomas More actually is in The Tudors, um, where you see Thomas More both as, as a scholar and, and um, as this wise person, but also you see the darker side of More. And I think both are, are true. And funnily enough, yeah, it's The Tudors that seems to, get to, to mix them together. Thomas More was a player in the deadliest court in Europe, the court of King Henry VIII. How skilled a politician was Moore, and how inevitable was his demise? It's a very good question. Um, he was certainly um, a skilled politician. He, he studied hard how to be a good politician. He was part of a movement that took seriously the idea of, of being a public servant and learning skills that would help you do that. Uh, he was willing to compromise on certain things. Um, for instance, uh, he was a good friend of Cardinal Wolsey, um, but when Wolsey fell and, and he took his position, he did publicly denounce him and condemn him. Um, so he was willing uh, to, to change his position. He lies at certain point um, for, for political reasons. So he is willing to play the game, but only up until a point. And he does hit that point with the break with Rome. Whether or not it's inevitable, I mean, Henry's change on his uh, support of the Pope is certainly not inevitable um, that, that you wouldn't have in the early 1520s thought that Henry VIII, this defender of the faith, um, would turn on the Pope. Um, so I, I don't think in that sense it's inevitable. And Moore knew how to play the game. Uh, he just wasn't willing to bend the rules that far. I mean, certainly Moore saw, um, he thought a lot about death. Um, death was um, one of the fundamental parts of his, his um, worldview, his, his framework for thought and action. Uh, he constantly refers to the memento mori, the remembrance of death, um, as a way of trying to separate out uh, what's real about the world, what's eternal about the world, what's divine about the world, um, and what isn't, what's ceremonial, what's um, trappings, what's artificial. And so the remembrance of death helps him to do that. He writes quite a bit about it. Um, and, and so the idea that, that he would use death as, a, as, a, as a, almost a form of protest is not that far off from his thought. So what separates Moore in character from his great rival Thomas Cromwell? Actually not all that much, to be honest. Um, they were actually uh, allies um, up until the very end, really. In the 1520s was probably the first time that they met when they were both in Parliament. Moore was um, Speaker, uh, Cromwell was there as an MP, and actually they would have been allies. Um, so although we don't have evidence of, of them getting together and talking about uh, policy, certainly they were on the same side of a number of debates. Um, at this time, Moore was a reformer, a religious reformer. He wanted change in the church. Cromwell was on the same page about that. They both opposed uh, the war in France. So they would have been allies and possibly even friends. What really separates them is just how far they're willing to go with that reform of the church. Um, Cromwell is obviously in favor of, of a break, um, of a much hard line, much more hard line reform, um, and more won't go that far. So it's actually, I think, something very, very small that separates the two of them. So in what ways was Thomas More a man for all seasons? 
I think so, yeah. So Man for All Seasons, that's uh, originally um, in a letter Erasmus writes. Uh, his dear friend Erasmus, fellow humanist, writes in description of more that he's a man for all seasons, that he's willing to be all things to all people. This is a great um, way of, of um, being a politician at this time to pay attention to the idea of decorum, the idea of speaking appropriately for a given audience. Um, and Erasmus is saying that Moore is a master of this rhetorical art. So hearkening back to what we were saying about him being a good politician, he took seriously this idea that you had to change your manner um, your style of speech and what you were saying for each individual audience, um, but you can't compromise too far. So that's that's where it, it, it stops for more. Um, he he couldn't be a man for for that particular season, that break with Rome. Turning to other aspects of your research, you've looked at the concept of time historically speaking, and today we tend to think of time as a constant linear parameter. But in the past, there were different kinds of time, weren't there? Yes, there were, and what, one of the things you get in the Renaissance is um, the revival of a Greek notion of time um, called kairos, or the opportune moment. Um, in Latin, it's sometimes acacio, or occasion. And so, in addition to the chronological um, straight line of time that you were talking about, you get these moments, these pockets, of, of exceptional time, of these, these rare moments where you can seize opportunity. And all of a sudden, the universal rules that govern um, morality that apply in chronological time don't apply anymore. So one of the things about decorum and season is this idea um, that you can um, bend the rules a little bit. Um, and that changes how being a politician uh, is that, that changes the rules around politics. And so you get people like Machiavelli um, saying that in order to seize the occasion, you have to bend the rules quite a bit. You have to um, get rid of all sense of morality. Um, sometimes you have to embrace vice. Um, this is not something that, for instance, Thomas More um, would, would get behind, um, but it's sort of the extension of this idea of being a man for all seasons, is that you adapt even your morality to suit the time, um, to seize the occasion. So what's next for you? Yeah, so I'm working on a book right now that's drawn from my PhD research. It looks at uh, theories of counsel and advice giving um, in the Tudor and Stuart courts, um, how to give advice in the most dangerous court in Europe um, while keeping your head, um, how to impact politics in an increasingly uh, absolutist monarchical regime.